Well, we have. We yeah, have there's no Italian in the group, so we're not being. We're yeah, not going to be shouting. But, but somebody else's voice getting in. Yes, yeah. yeah. Those hiles are pretty directional. How far apart are we going to? How big are these tents? The operators are going to be like this far apart. In January 1993, an international team of radio operators met in Honolulu to begin a de-expedition to Howland Island, at the time the second most needed country in Europe and number eight in the eastern USA. I wonder if it would make more sense to have the operators be side to side, side by side, so that they're talking that way instead of talking that way. I don't know. Oh, have one day, CW, one day phone. That night, the AH-1A team shared a last taste of civilization with some KH-6s, who were to become their most readily available contacts with the outside world. The next day, the 10 operators and two U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service representatives flew 1,200 miles south to Christmas Island to board the 70-foot schooner Machias. However did you pick Holland as an expedition site? Holland? Is that what you said? Uh, that is correct, yes. I thought we were going to Howland. Oh, God. This means we have to go on a boat? <laughs> Six days on a boat. How does it make that feel? How does this make you feel as a person? Seasick mostly. Seasick. Have you taken your pill today? I've taken both pills, and uh, I have a patch ready to install behind my ear. Oh, to install behind your ear. You're yes. going to, OK, that's behind one ear or two ears? Well, we're going to try just one, but I have a second one available you in the event one? I need one over here. Okay, so this one goes on the left-hand side. Does it say left? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay, now this is Bob K4UEE from Hawaii, where we make expenses for Northern California Dix Foundation. Yes. Uh, before we go on a trip to Ho Holland, 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 Holland. Uh, Hotel Alpha One Alpha. Thank you, Bob. Oh, Alpha Hotel One Alpha. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alpha Hotel uh, Alpha. Thank you. By the time you're finished, okay, thank you. you'll remember that thank call. You. Thank you. So thank you. So this uh, Air Nauru uh, plane is this is safe? Yeah, of course. Very safe. Yeah. Very and safe. will there be any pigs on board or chickens? There are chickens now. Chickens? Pigs or not? Uh, some. Some? Don't be shy, ask him. Yeah. Don't be shy, ask him. Okay, how many pigs? We have to know because we're hams too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yet, but uh, I think uh, there are some pigs. Okay. Okay, we're on our way to Tango 32. Honolulu International Airport. And a little bit. Well, 
Uh, this is the uh, Captain Cook Hotel. This is the site of most of the T-32 operations, if not all, from here. Paul uh, F-60XV used his call T-32BH, and John Ackley uh, used his call uh, T-32JA back in uh, 88 on our way through to uh, KH-5. We stayed here and operated a little bit uh, when we were on through, way through here to um, the AD-1S uh, portable KH-5 to Jarvis in 1983. And uh, this Captain Cook Hotel, named in honor of Captain Cook, who is uh, alleged to have discovered this island on uh, Christmas Day, and therefore it's called Christmas Island or Curitimas in uh, Gilbertese. That's a stunning uh, beach here, just beautiful. After enjoying their last cold drinks for a long while at the Captain Cook Hotel, the AH-1A team, along with Captain Bill Austin and his crew, boarded the Machias and departed for Howland Island at 8.10 p.m. local time on Tuesday, January 19th. What do you do most of your broadcasting at night? All day long. When we get to the island, we'll probably stay on the island almost all the time. Yeah. We won't be coming in and out too much. Well, we'll Depends be... on how far out you guys can anchor or how close. Well, we'll be shuttling into food and everything. On board ship, the team ran a barefoot Kenwood TS-450 to a 20-meter vertical dipole hung off the main mast with good results. It kept a daily schedule with support teams in Colorado and Belgium. We were QRV today just three or four hours ago, over. Okay, I got it, and uh, I've uh, pointed the beam a little bit more on you. Uh, your signal came up a little bit. We're going to go over the radio and the computer and how they interface with one another. So everybody has a decent idea of what's, uh, how this stuff all works. We'll start with the computer. Everyone will get, every station will get a plastic laminated version of this, which has all the controls on it for F1 through F10. And then it has different uh, meanings depending on whether you use uh, just the F10. During the five and a half day voyage, the team members became acquainted with each other okay. as well as with the computerized logging and Kenwood radios. Uh, normally, what, what you'll do is just type the call sign in, um, F6EXV, then hit return. Now, if the computer is going to be interfaced to the radio through um, a, uh, a, lev a level converter into a plug on the back of the radio. So you don't really have to worry about what band you're on because it will automatically track. What we're doing is Ian is taking a reading on the star Sirius, and he is measuring the angle between the horizon and the star. And he gives me a point where he takes the reading, and I see what the time is to the nearest second. And with this information, we're also doing some shots on Venus. And what's the other star, Bob? Capella. 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 Tell him what I'm doing. And well, Bob's writing down all the information. 
for posterity. The ship's geopositioning gear gave a continuous readout of their exact location, bearing, and distance to Howland. Ian, G4LJF, who was studying for a mariner certification, borrowed the captain's sextant and made his own manual calculations each evening. By the end of the trip, his calculations were yielding very accurate coordinates for the ship's location. 3341, 1833-41. Beth Flint, and I'm a wildlife biologist for the Hawaiian Pacific Islands National Wildlife Refuge Complex. And so my responsibility is to uh, advise the refuge managers for the, all the remote island refuges in the Pacific on biological issues and to monitor the populations of um, seabirds and plants and marine mammals and turtles on all the refuges that you citizens own in this in the Pacific. And so two of the refuges that we manage are Howland and Baker Islands, to which we're now headed. And they're so remote that we find it very difficult to get there. Um, so we're always pleased when radio operators want to go there because we can work with you and get a chance to go down to the refuge and, and see how things are, make sure there haven't been any trespasses or damage, damages to the island and monitor how the wildlife is doing. I've been a ham radio operator since I was 13 years old, some 35 years ago. I got interested in contesting and contest de expeditions about 15 years ago. and. Uh, I gotta tell you, this is the pinnacle, as far as I'm concerned, this is the biggie. We were talking earlier this morning about, about uh, the journey itself. We've been, uh, we've been underway now for about two and a half days. We've got about three to go, total of about 1,140 nautical miles, and right now, as we speak, we're about halfway. What we, uh, what we talked about earlier is that this is uh, one of the reasons that Howland Island is uh, near the top of the list in terms of most wanted. It's real hard to get there. <laughs> you got to make a commitment of both uh, resources, financial resources, and time. All the operators on this trip have made a substantial financial commitment, and most of them will be away from their jobs and their families for three and a half to four weeks. That's what makes it happen. That's what makes it fun. That's what makes it exciting. And for me, it makes it the, probably the most exciting thing I've ever done. Howland is number two and most wanted for Europe. So uh, as far as I can see, it, this team has pretty well prepared to be audible in Europe. Uh, if not that, at least have a strong signal. So we've been doing a bit of public relations with the European Ops to uh, heat up the, uh, the gangs over there. So we have huge pileups. Um, and I think it was uh, up to 80% 80, 80 of the people in Europe, or 90%, who still need uh, Howland. So we can expect some decent pileups of at least two or three people calling at the same time. I am the field self-operator uh, for this expedition. That means I uh, try to work uh, some uh, guys on six meters. It depends a lot of uh, propagation, but uh, we will try it. Uh, what about satellite? Uh, Satellite would be no problem. Um, I expect to work uh, around 600 people on satellite. In Europe, whatever, I made a lot of uh, public uh, relations. On my last trip to Clipperton, I worked only uh, three Dutch people. Now the window is very good, and uh, also people who cannot elevate their antenna system can work me. So uh, I said, I am there, you will be there. I like to work you. I live in just outside the city of Bordeaux. I usually say that I'd rather drink it than spill it. Uh, obviously the Pacific is the other side of the world, uh, so it's quite an adventure for any European to come over to the Pacific. Uh, I fell in love with the Pacific and I'm so glad I'm here again. We're enjoying some beautiful weather on a beautiful boat and we're all quite anxious to get to the island and start talking to the world with the constant uh, wish to hear Europeans. Well, how 
Samoan is one of the uh, American Polynesia islands that was uh, claimed during the Guano days in the mid and late 1800s when there was a rush on to uh, harvest guano from these uninhabited little islands. After the guano played out, the islands just sat there and were not much interest to anybody because they're off the beaten track. But the United States wound up with possession of the place and uh, maintained a, a claim which wasn't really enforced until just prior to World War II when there was an interest in uh, fortifying the Pacific, defending uh, American interests and uh, Trans-Pacific aviation. After the war, the uh, islands just reverted to uninhabited uh, American territory. And the Fish and Wildlife Service became interested in uh, protecting the wildlife resources and uh, eventually gained uh, jurisdiction over Howland, Baker, and Jarvis as National Wildlife Refuges. It's too hot right now and air conditioning's broken and I'm really bummed about that because cooking is not a lot of fun. <laughs> it was much better yesterday. <laughs> From Christmas Island, we're on our way to Howland Island. We're a little over halfway now with about 500 miles to go. Uh, we're running about uh, 48 miles or so north of the equator, which is the latitude of Howland Island, and we're headed due west. The island itself is, is U.S. territory, U.S. property. Uh, administrated by Fish and Wildlife as far as the game is concerned, and we have two Fish and Wildlife personnel on board that are guests of this uh, expedition. I'd have to look at the chart to get the exact size of Holland, but it's, it's very small. It's probably not more than a mile or so long, and it's narrower than that. Uh, low, I heard someone today mention 18 feet high. I've been there quite a few times myself, but I've never measured the size of it. Uh, it's in a, situated in a north-south direction, and in that respect, it, it does a good job of blocking the trade wind seas, which are the wind-driven seas generated by the northeast and southeast trade winds. And whether they're sea or by the time they reach the island swell, they do come in from the easterly side. Uh, we also have swell that comes in from the north and south uh, from higher latitudes in both directions from storms that could prevent us from landing uh, if it's going around to the west. Seldom does. Usually the west side is calm. That's the area where we'll attempt to, to land, where I think we will land. There's a very flat, shallow reef there that we have to go over in order to get up to the sand beach when we're carrying our equipment with the boats or by walking. So we'll wait for high water, high tide, and try and, and uh, come in through the surf, low surf, and power right on up to the beach with the outboards and then unload the boats that way. I know everybody is, you know, just sitting there with their arm on the switch ready to go. And you fellows will have a, a fun time, but it will also be a lot of work. So good luck, 73, and we'll see you when you get on the island. Thanks so much for the chat. It's been a pleasure to say hello to you while you're en route there to Holland. So 73 from Florida, and we'll look for you when you get on the island uh, in about 48 hours. F6EXV. Yeah, basically we should be QRV within about 48 hours. It's always very difficult to be quite certain on an exact time. So. Uh, when you start talking of unloading gear at high tide and so forth. Uh, so uh, that's just a rough idea. I don't think it would be a bit earlier. It might be a bit later. Uh, the only thing for sure is we'll be QRV as soon as we can. We've had the good fortune of getting a lot of manufacturer sponsors behind us. Uh, particularly Cushcraft Antenna Company who supplied uh, monoband beams that we're going to be using once we reach the island. Uh, we're hopeful that these beams will help us reduce interstation interference. That's a big problem in an expedition like this one where we're setting up four stations that may be operating simultaneously, and we may even have two stations operating simultaneously on the same band from time to time. So interstation interference is a big problem. Another problem that we've had to overcome on this uh, expedition is the the low bands, um, we can't really count on 10 and 15 meter propagation into Europe, so we've made a special effort to ensure that we have a good signal on 40 and 80 meters so that we'll be able to work uh, Europeans on those bands. And Butternut Antenna Corporation uh, assisted in the uh, uh, antenna, low band antenna category, 
We also are indebted to Alpha Amplifier Company, who's supplied us with the new Alpha 89 that we'll be uh, using on this trip. It's pretty easy to operate if you're real careful without causing death and destruction, but it's definitely something that those of us that work in seabird colonies had to learn through unpleasant, bitter experience, and I'll be able to teach you guys how to do it without having to cause mortality to the birds, and that's, um, I know that's not your primary mission, but it's my primary mission, so um, I hope that you'll all sort of Keep that in mind that until you feel like you're checked out to move through a colony alone, that you spend some time with me so I can teach you how to avoid um, causing death. Um, the other things, I'm not, I don't want to be all negative about this. I hope that you guys take advantage of this opportunity. You're going to a place that, unfortunately, most of the public will never, ever get to see, even though it belongs to them. It's, these places just can't tolerate a lot of public use for obvious reasons, but we're delighted when some people do get to see it, and we hope that you'll become advocates for these resources. Well, there are a couple of things we need to um, Why don't you go over, Bert? talk about this morning. <laughs> Number one, we need to pack some gear to take on the island. You know, it's hard to say how much you need, but I take everything you need because you don't want to be running back and forth. I think it'd be a good idea to try and pack those bags this morning and then try to put all your gear up in your bunk. And we need to start taking gear out in the floor and seeing what we've got and finding the, the priority items that we need to take uh, to um, the island first. Uh, we need to find the Kenwood filters. Well, I don't think we found those yet, have we? And you know, a lot of things like that. I just found the medical bag last night. So a lot of things we need to drag out. So if everybody would get all their gear up in their bunk, and uh, and then we'll drag the other stuff out. I hope everybody takes it easy, but you're going to be jumping out of these boats. Just be careful. Never jump down until you you look where you're jumping. There may be a holes in the reef or partial holes. Your your foot may go in the side. We don't want any broken ankles or bad sprains, because that'll take you out of the action. How close to the sand beach will the boat be able to go? Well, it, at high tide, it'll be able to go pretty close in. But at low tide, we'll have to walk out to the end of the coral shelf take stuff out and walk across the reef and you always got to look down where you're walking uh, there will be these um, sea urchins the Hawaiians called vana and uh, they have these uh, prickly spines can sometimes embed in you so you just want to stay away from those things uh, it might even be a good idea to wear socks even though they're going to get wet we want to start the trip off safely we don't want anybody to get hurt so you have to be very careful watch where you're uh, jumping uh, I would suggest you do just what the just what the boat handler says, because we don't want the boats tipping over either. Uh, but the coral cuts are the most likely thing that people are going to have problems with, because they're going to stumble and maybe fall and have catch your hand or something like that. They need to be cleaned out very well. In uh, Chicago, um, part owner in a manufacturing facility that we manufacture uh, industrial power rectifiers or large power supplies. And with the power background, uh, have worked with emergency systems, uh, generating equipment, uh, large synchronous motors, generators. And part of my expertise, uh, my job on this trip is to handle the power end of it, to make sure that the stations have the power they need to operate uh, in the realm of our goals. And the way it looks right now, we're, we're achieving that will be uh, taking on the island four generators uh, should supply enough power to run the stations uh, to the limit that we want to run them. For the last three months I've been putting together the coax cable and all the interface cables like the CT parallel cables, the keyer cables, been uh, putting together the headsets, just about all the interfacing cables for the rigs. All together, I think we have uh, 3,000 feet worth of coax. Um, a third of that is RG8X, which is pretty easy to put together. And then the other 2,000 feet were 14 different lengths of RG213. 
and uh, I'm sure all of you know how fun PL259s are to put together. Luckily, I had help from Phil, Alpha Hotel 6 Fox Sugar. He helped me one Saturday. So uh, I have been having a lot of fun the last three months. I'm glad we're finally on the boat and I don't have to work so hard. I'm Ian, Gulf 4 Lima, Julia Foxtrot. I come from 35 miles west of London. Occupation is a commercial airline pilot flying 747s around the world. And uh, other interests are uh, what we're doing right now. It's ocean sailing. Very pleased to be on this expedition. It's been a while since I've done one of my own and uh, looking forward to running the pileups. The real work, of course, will start tomorrow when we reach Howland Island and have to put all the uh, stuff we've got below decks here together. Um, one of the best bits of the trip for me so far has been uh, skipper Bill Austin has let me use the sextant on the ship and we've been uh, practicing astro navigation with the stars and the sun plotting our way along and uh, getting myself towards the goal of an ocean yacht master rating which uh, I should go back and finish when I get home after the trip. Other interests which I hope to do in Hawaii on the way back is flying hang gliders but uh, one of the problems we're having right now is we just had a, a raid from pirates and uh, I'm not feeling too good in the head. My uh, home is uh, in a suburb just south of Chicago and uh, I work uh, at a hospital very close to my home uh, as a, an associate director of the emergency department. And uh, my uh, involvement with the uh, KH-1 Howland expedition started probably uh, on the way home from Kingman Reef in 1988 when uh, Bert and I uh, talked about what to do next. And uh, over the years, various things came up that uh, put our plans on hold. And uh, about uh, almost a year ago now, uh, we started to seriously look at activating Howland. And uh, this trip that we're on now is the culmination of uh, probably about a year's uh, planning uh, between Bert and myself. Monday morning, January 25th, 1993. Howland Island is in sight. A welcoming delegation of porpoises escorts the Machias. KH-1 once consisted of four islands, Canton, Enderbury, Baker, and Howland. Of those, only Canton is accessible by scheduled commercial maritime transport. Eric, SM0AGD, operated KH-1 from Canton in the early 80s. However, in 1983, the USA turned Canton and Enderbury over to the Republic of Kiribati. They are now T-31, leaving only Baker and Howland in KH-1. During her 1937 round-the-world flight, Amelia Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, headed from New Guinea to Howland Island. Their mysterious disappearance focused worldwide attention on the island. A commemorative day beacon was built on Howland in her honor. It's in disrepair now, but it remains the most prominent landmark on the island.
The team quickly realized that they had underestimated the heat. Rather than about five degrees warmer than Hawaii, as expected, it turned out to be about 20 degrees warmer, with a daytime average high of about 108 to 115 degrees in the shade. Did you find the CW filters yet? things that are missing are here. trying to get the stations on the air and the Kenwoods to work with the Alphas. By 8 p.m. that day, three station tents, a sleeping tent, and one HF station were assembled, along with one of the Cushcraft 20-meter monobanders. At 0905 Zulu, Mike, K9AJ, made the inaugural QSO on 20-meter CW and was welcomed by a horde of JAs led by JA0EAI. Three minutes later came the first USA station, KC4MK. The first European, OZ7YY, was logged six hours later at 1529 Zulu. Although thrilled to finally be on the air, the team still faced an incredible amount of work and had no time to relax. Ari, PA3DUU, worked feverishly to get the VHF station going. He quickly put 86 JAs in the 6-meter log. 6-meter DXing requires incredible patience and dedication, and Ari showed both in abundance as he continuously monitored 10 meters for a response to his 6-meter beacon. Unfortunately, just two more JA's contacts were made in the following days. It's 1.45 local time. There's really no hope of doing any work with that shade from about 10 till 3. So we have to put up the shade first and then uh, do the work. Now how many more HF2Vs do we have to go? 37. <laughs> 37 HF2V and HF2V farming here. We're going to have a total of 300 HF2Vs. All phased? All phased. Okay, plant a plot of them and then we're going to come back in 50 years and see how many there are. That's right. Uh-oh. <laughs> what? I hit the airplane. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fortunately, this is not the airplane that we arrived in. Uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't arrive in an airplane. There's the wing in the background, which serves as our restroom. Okay, now don't you feel better after all that hard work? It's just started. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Excuse me, sir. Where are you going with this antenna? Oh, 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 I was just gonna borrow it. I didn't mean to take it. Okay. Bring it back by this evening. We need it for Europe. The gray coming out. The black one. This one? Yeah, that's the one. Changing operators is always fun. Changing gears. With eight HF operators and four HF stations, each man averaged 12 hours of operating per day. Working on antennas and keeping the camps maintained consumed more hours. Very little time was left for sleep. The bugs, crabs, and rain conspired to rob the team of sleep when they found time for it. But they were making over 7,000 QSOs a day, and that kept enough adrenaline flowing to keep them awake when in front of a radio. Oh, you're nice to go on this. Let's see, going through the basket. Choose it. Which ice filter we want here? 20 meter over 10 meter antenna on the Radio Shack mast. And working quite well. 
Four on the 15 meter. Working well. I hear something behind the tent that doesn't seem to be working well. So here it is. Not quite 8 o'clock in the morning. It's up to 90 degrees already in the shade. So here's the sideband tent. Uh, right now, Paul, F6EXV, is on 20. And uh, Peter, O16T, is on 15. Paul just had me turn the beam, so uh, we're operating long path to the east coast of the United States. Seems to be working. So it's pointed out to the uh, southwest. The United States is about 40 to 50 degrees. Uh, short path from here. Stand by, stand by. We might try Europe on 10 meters also. Well, keep, keep on 15 while you still have prop. Have you worked France? Okay. Would you a, try on 10? A, a, a three radio, three radio, 59. Okay, Alpha Hotel 1 Alpha. Listing 310 Euro. Yeah, I have you. Italy 8 Can November. Can you sell WN3R, Japan, QRZ? Uh, Italy 8, November Hotel Japan, I have you, QSL. November Papa Fox, 59. WA4 Zulu Bravo Kilo, Kilo, 59. Italy 1, Tango Ocean Uniform, QSL. QSL Bravo Tango, QRZ up. Last letter, India, 59. Any more Europe, 300, 310, any more Europe? And now over to the realm of the exotic, six meters in satellite. Aries antenna along with, uh, he was able to make use of Max uh, Carolina Wyndham here. KG0Es. And strung it between two masts. Good morning. That's the six meter beacon on. It's a six meter beacon on, on uh, 50.110. And beam heading at the moment is uh, into Japan. Working Europe from Howland was extremely challenging. The team struggled each morning to put a few more Europeans in the 80 meter log. At dusk, they concentrated on the 40 meter CW openings and were rewarded with many extraordinary QSOs under the most difficult circumstances imaginable big pileups of exceedingly weak signals. The outstanding group of European operators who made it into the log showed impressive patience and skill. They got through despite the poor conditions. Because the openings were brief, the timing was especially critical. The use of pilot stations in the US and Europe provided daily feedback on any concerns about AH-1A's operating procedures. The team made quick adjustments accordingly. For example, when told that 30 meters was providing the best signals into Europe, they began emphasizing that band with excellent results. They also made several hundred 20 meter radio teletype QSOs because of recommendations from the pilots. Up to a year had gone by on Howland without any recorded rainfall, so the team was unprepared for the torrential downpours. It rained for several days straight at a peak rate of one inch per hour. Everything except the all important operating equipment got soaked. Even the high quality tents began to leak and at times there was two inches of water on the floor. As the rain soaked into the thirsty soil, the smell of guano permeated the air. One operator said it was like living on the floor of a giant birdcage. On several afternoons, the rain came down so hard they could shower in it, rinsing off the salt residue left from bathing in the ocean. Here it is, five o'clock local time. Tuning 160. The 160 contest here with Friday night, January 29th, AH1A operated just about all night in the CQ CW 160 meter contest. The team debated doing this because a contest can detract from the success of a de-expedition. On the other hand, they felt that the 160 contest would allow them to maximize their QSOs on that band. Besides, K4UEE, a member of the Southeastern DX Association, wanted to help his club beat the Frankfurt group this year by contributing a strong entry. AH1A ended up with well over a thousand QSOs on 160. By Saturday, January 30th, the team was ready for the weekend crowds. Working the huge pileups was an incredible thrill for everyone. It was the culmination of years of DXing and contesting experience. 
Peak CW rates approach 250 per hour, and the phone rates 400 per hour. With the help of the WF-1B software, even the radio teletype rates were high. To maximize the total rate, the team decided to have five HF stations going simultaneously during the weekend. The ICE bandpass filters worked great, and there was minimal interstation interference. The HF operators enlisted the help of PA3DUU and W9IXX, who until this time had been spending all their time in the VHF tent, and the combined rate zoomed. With so many stations on the air, AH1A was able to realize another of its goals, working a few novices and techs on CW. They went down to 15 meters, cranked back the speed on the keyer, and made CW contacts with KD6FWY, KC6FWH, KA9TTB, and KB6LEV. On Sunday evening, January 31st, with the weekend over and the pileups subsiding, the team turned its attention to planning for departure. They decided to take down the VHF station Monday afternoon, the CW stations and one of the SSB stations Tuesday afternoon, and the final SSB station Wednesday morning. They had to be completely off the island by noon Wednesday, February 3rd, in order to reach Tarawa Kiribati in time to catch the weekly Air Nauru flight back to Honolulu. Tuesday, February 2nd. Although the surf had picked up a bit, the team got one load out to the boat as they began the work of winding down the operation. They had met their goal of one solid week of operating, and now it was time to go home. Their focus turned to dismantling and packing the stations. In the rising surf, getting a second load out proved to be impossible. The captain decided to leave the raft on shore and came up with a plan that would at least return him to the ship before nightfall. He called the Machias and asked the crew to tie a line to the other raft and throw the line into the surf to be washed ashore. The crew tied a big plastic bucket to the line to catch the surf. The waves were cresting just outside the reef. The crew rowed the raft along the edge of a wave and threw the bucket over the wave and into the surf. Then they sped away before the wave could catch them and wash them ashore. Once the bucket and line were ashore, the captain attached his surfboard and had the raft tow him out. The first couple of attempts were unsuccessful. Finally, a lull allowed him to make it through, and he made it safely to the ship. The captain was low-key about these problems, but the team suspected, just by the look of the sea, that they might be stuck on Howland for days. Captain Bill was calm and confident, but suggested that they start collecting rainwater. Overnight, they collected several gallons in a tarp arranged over a depression in the ground. It was Wednesday, February 3rd, the day of their scheduled departure, but it was obvious that they would not be leaving. A big storm had come in the night before, and the surf was pounding the landing area with 10-foot breakers. The ship had been tossed about wildly during the night, and the captain had injured his wrist while on watch. He had wrapped some duct tape around it and continued to work, but the crew was convinced that it was broken. The continuing high surf prevented resupply of food or water on Wednesday. The following morning, Captain Bill and Kurt the cook were unceremoniously deposited on shore when their raft got on the wrong side of a big breaker while they were trying to toss the team some food. Medical doctors Bert, W0RLX, and Mike, K9AJ, took a look at the captain's wrist and pronounced it officially broken. They brought out some instant cast and had him fixed up within an hour. That evening, the team decided to ration their remaining food and water rather than risk more ship-to-shore supply runs in the dangerous weather and surf conditions. Friday morning, February 5th, they learned that the boat's electrical system had failed during the night. The generators had died and the batteries were too weak to restart them. Without its electrical system, the boat was in serious trouble. The water makers and pumps would not work, nor would the radar, radio, or geopositioning equipment. Phil, W9IXX, volunteered to go out to the boat and try to bring the system back up, and Kurt agreed to take him. The entire team assembled on shore at high tide for Phil and Kurt's daring escape attempt. They held onto the raft and walked it out onto the reef, trying to keep it from flipping as the surf crashed over it. And then they waited for just the right moment, a lull in the surf. Eventually, the lull came, and after a harrowing wave ride, the rubber boat got clear of the breakers and headed safely for the ship. The team faced many more challenges before their departure. 
They hiked to the opposite side of the island to collect rainwater from giant clamshells. They used flashlights for Morse code communication with the ship and as a beacon to enable it to hold a safe offshore position during the nights without power. And they risked drowning and suffered coral scrapes helping to tow a generator out to recharge the ship's batteries. But this group remained confident, supported one another and the crew, and kept its cool in the face of persistent problems. Teamwork and overcoming adversity had become as much a part of the pride of this epic D expedition as the QSO total. On Monday, February 8th, two weeks after their arrival and six days after their scheduled departure, the AH-1A team left Howland Island. <laughs>